Okay, well, I'm going to get us started. Um, I first want to thank you all for coming today. Instead of taking a long Labor Day weekend, um, we really appreciate it, and it's a great turnout. Um, my name is Barbara Pitkin, and I'm the director of the department's International Technical Assistance Program. Um, and I wonder if I could just start off by having a show of hands for those in the audience who have participated on ITAP assignments. Not as many as I thought, okay. And uh, how about people who receive our distribution list, our announcements of upcoming activities? Okay, so anyone who's not receiving that, please do sign up today. We do have a sign up sheet because that will keep you informed of what we're doing and what opportunities are coming up. Um, this presentation is part of a year-long series of presentations that are celebrating ITAP's 20th anniversary, but we still think that ITAP is one of the department's best-kept secrets. Um, and we're trying to change that in the next 20 years uh, by letting people know what we do and how we do it and what are some of the results that we're um, getting in the field. Um, just in a nutshell, ITAP is basically the gateway for the department to provide technical assistance to overseas governments on all of the things that we do domestically in the department. So over the years, we've developed a portfolio of projects that really does mirror what DOI does here, here at home. So we have wildlife trafficking projects, we have renewable energy projects, we have GIS and land cover projects that you'll hear about, um, wor work that focuses on public participation, water management, hydroelectric, pretty much you name what DOI does and we have an ITAP project that does similar work overseas. Um, I'm going to be happy to answer questions about ITAP after the presentation, but I'd really like to kick off this, um, this particular uh, session by introducing the two speakers that you'll be hearing from today. Um, the first is Justin Epting, who is with Fish and Wildlife Service, a GIS specialist uh, based in Sacramento. And Justin's provided a lot of leadership on this initiative uh, in Southeast Asia. So you'll be hearing about his work in Southeast Asia first. And then you'll be hearing from Jean Parcher, who is our project manager extraordinaire. Jean has been working, uh, actually leading the Land Cover for Climate initiative since its inception. Uh, when we turned it over to Jean, it was an idea. Uh, it was written on paper, a few sentences, um, and Jean has developed this idea into a full-fledged project, which has touched three major regions on the globe with some really impressive results. So I'm excited to turn over the mic to these two. We'll bring up Justin first, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Barb, for the introduction, and thanks to you all for uh, coming out today. I'm excited to talk to you about this project, Land Cover for Climate, that I've been working on now with Gene for the past about two years. So Land Cover for Climate is essentially uh, designed to improve the capacity of in-country staff in developing countries to map land use and land cover using techniques of uh, remote sensing, so sat using satellite imagery, computer processing power, et cetera. And um, so they had, they, the goals were basically to increase capacity through, through trainings. Um, we also wanted to increase access to data. So through a partnership with the USGS, we were able to provide satellite imagery to the countries as well and not just raw satellite data, but processed satellite imagery, which makes it a lot easier for these countries to work with the imagery. And as Barb said, um, <clears throat> Jean and I kind of uh, worked in different geographies. Jean was working in Africa, so she'll talk about the Africa portion in a little bit. And I'm gonna focus today on the work in Southeast Asia. And we had originally planned to work in four countries in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. And we did do trainings with all four countries. But in the end, we ended up really focusing a lot of the, the effort in Vietnam. And all, I should mention also that all this work is funded by USAID. So what I'm going to cover today is, um, first I'll give you kind of a background on why this work is important and why it's supported by the US government. And 
with that is an overview of climate change and the, the potential impacts of climate change, because that's <clears throat> really why we're doing this work. And then when, when people think of climate change, they, they generally think of CO2 emissions, carbon emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. But there's also a lot of emissions that come from the land use sector. And that's the sector that we were focusing on with this, with this project. That's why it's called land cover for climate. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how land use changes in land use can affect um, greenhouse gas emissions. And then I'll also talk about how we can estimate those emissions using remote sensing. And as I said, I will uh, frame this with the work from Vietnam. And um, it's interesting because when I, when I put these slides together and I just kind of I, I, I put this map here of Vietnam, and I've been to Vietnam several times and, and traveled up and down the coast. I know it's a very long country, as you can see from the map. And when I looked it up, it actually has over 2,000 miles of coastline. So you, know, you can kind of understand why Vietnam is very concerned about climate change and why they're really interested in working with us and other uh, international partners on this kind of effort. Um, they, have, they have a lot of coastline. This whole area down here, the Mekong Delta, is where they grow a lot of the rice production. That's what feeds the country. It's also a big export crop. And that area is extremely flat and very low. So any small amount of sea level rise can impact the, the, that rice growing region. And a lot of their cities are also located uh, in those lower coastal areas as well. So just um, to make sure everyone's on the same page when I talk about greenhouse gas emissions, and just to kind of recap the, the science behind climate change, um, essentially, uh, we have this atmosphere, right? And people talk about atmospheric gases or, or greenhouse gases. And the, the, what, what happens basically with the sun is this ball of fire, right? This the, in that's out in space. It's emitting massive amounts of energy, solar radiation. Some of that energy is reflected directly from the atmosphere, so it doesn't actually reach the planet. But a lot of it is either absorbed by the land or, or sea or reflected back into space. But even this. This, the energy that's absorbed by the sun is also re-radiated back into space. So if, if our planet was like the moon and we didn't have any atmosphere at all, it would just be a barren rock, right? So the atmosphere actually allows us to survive. It gives us the biosphere. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be here. However, if, if the, um, the concentration of those gases increases, then it, then it acts to trap in more of that energy. And so that's what people are talking about, right? We've basically all have evolved. Our societies have evolved. Our agricultural practices have evolved under a constant um, CO2 concentration, essentially. And now we're, we're increasing that and, and kind of altering the system. And when we talk about greenhouse gases, um, there are three main gases that, that are of, of note. Of course, the, the main one is carbon dioxide. The reason that one's so important is just there's so much of it. Any burning of fossil fuels emits CO2. So there's massive amounts of CO2, and that's the one that we've really altered in our atmosphere. Um, methane is also a very potent greenhouse gas, though. There's this concept called global warming potential, which basically is it, just a comparison to uh, CO2. So CO2, by default, is a global warming potential of 1. Methane has a global warming potential of at least 28, roughly. It, it, it diminishes with time. So they, they generally say for the first 100 years, it's, it's a little bit over 28. So that means it's 28 times more effective at trapping that heat than CO2. And nitrous oxide is even more effective. But nitrous oxide is very, it's not a big part of uh, the atmosphere. We don't generate a lot of it. And so it's not um, really considered as much. But if carbon dioxide and the methane are the real two big culprits. And, and those are the ones we'll, that I'll focus on. So, um, of course, there's a lot of talk in the news lately about these carbon emissions. Um, there was a meeting in Bonn recently. I don't know if it was this week. Uh, it's kind of a prelude to the big meeting that's coming up in, in Paris, right, the, the, the COP meeting, where basically all the countries in the world are getting together to try and reduce uh, the, the effects of, of climate change and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so why, why are people so concerned? Um, well. I mean, the, the potential for uh, impacts on, on so many uh, facets of our life is really, really massive. I mean, major impacts to the economy, to agriculture, and the environment. And the easiest one probably to think about is sea level rise. It's estimated that about two-thirds of the world's cities are coastal, right? I mean, we only have to look here in the US, look at what happened in New Orleans, 
with Katrina, look at Superstorm Sandy. Those kind of major flooding events are going to put trillions of dollars of infrastructure at risk. So we either have to um, fortify those areas or we have to clean up after we have flooding events or we have to move, right? No matter what you do, that costs money, lots and lots of money. A little bit um, less direct but also really important are the effects from drought and severe weather. I'm from California, right? I, I've been experiencing the worst drought on our record. And also you know, drought in um, concert with ex in increasing temperatures. 2014 was the, the warmest year ever in California. 2015 is probably going to be warmer yet because of El Nino. And so we're seeing the effects of, of drought um, firsthand. Fortunately, we have uh, ways of acquiring water for our agriculture. So our agriculture hasn't been completely um, curtailed. It's been, it's, it has been uh, reduced somewhat, but they're, they're pumping groundwater now basically to, in order to continue agriculture. But that's not sustainable because at some point the groundwater is going to give out. And there's already cities in California that are running out of water because they rely on groundwater. So you have a couple things happening where you know, our, our population is increasing. It's estimated that by 2050, we could have 9 or 10 billion people in the world. Um, so we have to, and, and the FAO says, in order to feed all these people, agricultural production has to double by 2050. So we have to double our agricultural production at the same time that we're having all these, these droughts and flooding events and, and disruption in, in climate that affects um, our food production. So that leads to food insecurity, it can lead to famine, um, it, it can cause whole countries to really become destabilized. And that, that's a uh, global or national security threat. And so uh, climate change is recognized as a national security threat by both the State Department and the Pentagon. Uh, it's considered a threat multiplier, so it can increase or exacerbate conditions that already exist, um, or it can create its own problems. And even back in 2003, um, Andrew Marshall wrote for the, in a report for the Pentagon that disruption and conflict will be endemic features of life in, in the future in a changing climate. So it's really obviously very important. Um, it's why all the countries are coming together to try to discuss this. And it's why this work is funded by our government as well. So just to um, visualize some of the nasty effects of climate change, um, as I talked about drought, so desertification. Um, you could also show crops here kind of withering. That would maybe be more of an impactful picture. Uh, sea level rise, this is an exaggeration, of course, but just to show you know, what could happen with, with drastic sea level rise. And of course, loss of habitat. I haven't talked much about that, but I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so we're very concerned about habitat for um, endangered species or other species that may become threatened or endangered due to loss of habitat. Uh, of course, a lot of people talk about or uh, hear about polar bears. That's a, a kind of a very iconic symbol of changes in the Arctic. But again, in, in the West, where I'm from, uh, there's another great example of, what, of climate change uh, hurting uh, species right now, which is with salmon. And uh, in California and in Oregon and Washington, there's just been a drought. And uh, basically right now, a lot of the salmon are dying. They're, they're trying to migrate up, upstream, and the water temperatures are just too warm. And so the salmon are dying, or the one, they're drying out and actually being stranded. And so um, this has been going on for several years now. And because salmon only have a, a three to four year life cycle, if you have several bad years in a row, the populations can, can really be, be cut dramatic, uh, drastically. And salmon is vital to a lot of the, the social, um, uh, to society in, in the Pacific Northwest, to the, to the tribes and to others. And it's a, it's a it has a big economic value and a cultural value and a biological value. So, you know, we, we wouldn't want to see something like salmon disappearing from, from that area. So um, when we talk about climate change, like as I said, the, you know, world leaders are trying to discuss now about trying to limit uh, increase in temperature to two degrees Celsius, right? We hear that a lot in the news. And so basically what, what they're talking about is trying to keep the world at, a, at something that looks like this on the left. This is just two different uh, representations of what temperature anomalies will be like in the future. So this is a really hot world, and this is a less hot world. This one's still warmer than now, but not this. This, this one on the right is basically a catastrophic world, where we're talking uh, 8 or 9 degrees Celsius increases in temperature. We don't even know what that world would look like, but it wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> and, 
you know, it would it would be hard for societies to probably function, not to mention what would happen to uh, ecosystems. So that's why world leaders are really trying to keep um, things to this level here. And so how do how do they come up with these projections? And how do they, you know, how, when we're talking about climate change, how do we even know what we what the current conditions are, what's going to happen in the future? Well, fortunately, there's this, this framework in place uh, through the UN, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed and ratified by over 188 countries um, in 1992. And you can actually go to this website and um, you can look at individual countries and, and look at their reporting. So um, if they have all of the developed countries have been doing this for, for several years where they you can find for the United States what our greenhouse gas emissions are uh, on an annual basis. But for developing countries, um, they're just starting to do this, and there haven't been uh, very many, around a dozen or so, I think, uh, to date. Maybe maybe a few more now. But Vietnam actually is one of those. So Vietnam now has um, produced a, a, a national report on their climate emission, on their greenhouse gas emissions. And um, I'm going to talk more about that in, in a moment. Um, when we think about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, of course, we think a lot about this, burning of fossil fuels, uh, free for, for electricity generation or transportation, um, anything that you know is consuming fossil fuels will emit CO2. But there's also, also this other this sector, the land use sector. And as I said, that's what this project focused on. And so uh, if we take forests, for example, forests have a lot of carbon in them, right? Because what do trees do? They, they take the CO2 out of the atmosphere and use it to build their cells, to build cellulose. And so when you take a mature forest and it, and it burns or it's cut and left to, to rot, that carbon is going to be emitted back into the atmosphere. Um, this process goes much faster than this process, but they both will actually emit CO2. If, if the products are, if the wood is harvested and then the wood is made into furniture or something, that is still maintains as wood, so it's not going to be emitting CO2. But when it's left out to, to basically, ex, you know, exposure to um, bacteria in, in, in the environment, it's going to be broken down. And the other um, big source is, this is the big source for methane, and this is a cattle, with a cattle. And cattle produce methane uh, through their guts, through their rumen. They, you know, they, they have these multi-chambered uh, guts, and then there's bacteria in there that break down the, their forage. And that, the, the, through that process, a lot of methane is produced. And so that's um, why you hear about cattle in, 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 in the context of climate change. And so this um, diagram kind of shows a lot of these sources. Uh, here you, know, you can see the cows. You can see burning, emitting actually all of the gases, um, except for methane, you know, cows producing methane. And another interesting one I haven't talked yet about is rice. So uh, wet rice, paddy rice cultivation, <coughs> also emits methane. And that's because it's uh, flooded. The fields are flooded, and you get anaerobic conditions. And so again, those bacteria that are producing methane in those anaerobic conditions. Another big one is soil carbon, and that's one we didn't even focus on in this work in, in Vietnam. A lot of countries don't because it's it's a lot more complex. It involves a lot of work, and um, a lot of people usually the countries just don't have the kind of, that kind of information. Okay, so now we're getting into the remote sensing side, and that's actually where I come in. I'm, I'm a GIS remote sensing uh, person. I've been doing this for a, a long time now. And, um, so when we're looking at, you know, these trying to estimate greenhouse gas emissions over an entire country, for example, we could do that by going out in the field. You know, if we have a ton of field staff, we can um, do intensive sampling and come up with, with estimates. But we can also use satellite data and do it much more quickly and cheaply. And so that's where remote sensing comes into to play. And remote sensing is simply the science of obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance. And like I said, we're using satellite data. You can also get imagery from aircraft. And I just want to, for those of you who may not be as familiar with remote sensing, I just want to go over a couple of things just to kind of point out that, um, that there's no real magic bullet with remote sensing. Uh, there's a different approach for each project you're working on or each you know, question you're trying to answer. So these are two um, images actually from, from where I live. This is our airport, the Sacramento Airport. And this is the Sacramento River right here. And then this is a, uh, does anybody know what that is? 
Yeah, very good. <clears throat> it's a golf course. So you can kind of make out both, you know, both all the features in, in each one of these images. This is a Landsat image. How many people have heard of Landsat before? Most of you, right? Okay. This is uh, what's called NAEP. This is a one meter aerial photo flown by the USDA. And um, so this has much higher resolution than Landsat. Landsat actually was designed, hence, you know, looking at the name Landsat, designed to map land cover, right? And it does that very well, especially if we're looking at larger areas. Um, the other thing that's nice about Landsat is you notice how here the river is much darker than in than here. This is a natural color image. So this is basically just acquiring data in the same wavelengths that, that our eyes see. Landsat actually goes beyond the, the, the wavelengths that we can see and, and captures data in a bigger portion of the, the electromagnetic spectrum. And so because of that, it's a little bit easier to discriminate between different objects on the landscape. Um, having those extra wavelengths, those extra bands, really makes um, it easier to, to do our classification, we call it, where we're picking out different parts of the landscape. So that's one of the trade-offs is um, what's called spectral resolution, the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that's captured. There's also spatial resolution, which is the, the, small, the pixel size, the, so the smallest element of the image. As I said, Landsat is 30 meters. That NAEP was one meter. So if we zoomed in and we wanted to map the parking lot of the airport, we would not use the Landsat, right? Here, we just see a bunch of pixels. It's kind of can't really make out much. Here, we could map every single building. We could map the trees. We could map the roads and trails. We could, we could map everything with, with the NAEP. But we wouldn't want to map an entire country with this. That would take us a year or longer, <laughs> right? So like I said, it's, it's a matter of uh, finding out what you know, kinds of questions you want to address and choosing the right um, imagery, the right data source to do it. So fortunately, we have Landsat. Um, Landsat is free. It's, um, it's also a US product. You know, it was created by the USGS and NASA. And we have a long history of Landsat data. We know how to work with Landsat data. So it's the perfect option for, for this project. So um, just show you some pictures of what some of these land use changes look like from space. This is actually not from uh, Vietnam or Southeast Asia. This is from the Amazon. But it's, I like these, uh, this picture because it's kind of an interesting pattern that we see sometimes with deforestation. Um, and this is called a fishbone pattern. And basically what happens is somebody puts a road in here. And it might just be a, a crude logging road. And then individuals come in and gradually chip away at the forest to take out little, you know, a few logs here and there and there. And then next thing you know, you've got this pattern. We also sometimes just see clear cuts, right? If you, you know, then it's just a, uh, it's really easy to tell which, what, where the forest is and where it's not. So you might have a whole area that's just completely cleared of all trees. Fire is another interesting one. Um, of course, we have a lot of fires in the West right now. When a fire burns an area, it produces what's called a burn scar. And these are actually evident in the in, in satellite imagery for several years following a fire um, until all the vegetation has grown back and obscured that, that signal on the ground. And this is another, uh, those were both Landsat images, by the way. This one is a higher resolution image. It's not Landsat. But I wanted to show this because we're working in Vietnam. There's a lot of rice production in Vietnam. And this is kind of the way that they have rice production. It's a lot of uh, family-run farms. Um, so you might have a, a house and then a plot of land that they're farming. It's not the massive industrialized agriculture that we have, for the most part. OK, so um, we take our satellite imagery. And we're basically, what we're doing is we're analyzing that satellite imagery to come up with, with the land use data. This, it's also called activity data. And then what we do to create these uh, greenhouse gas inventories is we combine that with our climate data and soils data. And the, the reason we combine it with those, or we overlay them, is, is just to get a, um, a, a more refined estimate of what the emissions are. And that's because, for example, um, if we're looking at forestry, trees grow faster where there's more water, generally. So if we look at our climate and we have you know, an area with higher precipitation, generally the trees are going to grow faster there. Also, de things decay faster, right? Things break down faster in wetter environments. Um, and also in warmer environments. So by combining these, we get, we get better estimates of our emissions. And then there are um, equations, basically, that people can use 
to estimate um, forest gain, forest uh, loss uh, in these different parts of the world and in these different climate scenarios. And that all comes from um, the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and their guidelines. Okay, so um, now getting into the kind of more specifics of, of the, the work that I did. And this is the part everyone talks about, the international travel, the I and ITAP, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. And as I said, we, we worked in Southeast Asia, so these are some of the places that we went. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on Vietnam. So um, the work in Vietnam, we actually did a training there back in December of 2013. And we had several of their agencies in the training. We, we probably had about 30 people. Um, and that was very successful. And then we also met with the Vietnamese. Um, we had a workshop in Jakarta. This was a joint workshop with some other USAID programs. Uh, Silver Carbon primarily is a big one, and also with the EPA. And it was focused on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the land use sector, as, as I mentioned. And um, during this, this workshop, I gave a presentation on, using, on, on creating national level land cover data sets using the US as an example. Here we have something called the NLCD, the National Land Cover Data Set, which is a uh, produced by the USGS. It's a, it's a national data set produced every, every five years, and it's a great example of having a, some, a national product that somebody can use. And um, after this workshop, actually, uh, the, the director of the Vietnam Rural Sensing Department is named Dr. Hoon. He, he was at this workshop, and he, he contacted Gene afterward and said, hey, we want to work with you guys um, more closely. And so they actually, while that was happening, you know, I, through their political system, I think they were getting um, pressure to also create national land cover maps, and or at least to have something that they could use for their greenhouse gas emissions, because they had been um, at a national level they had they had created that as a priority. So here are some of the pictures from the training we did in 2013, and then I went back this year, back in March, um, to work more more closely, more one on one with the the, the actual technicians at their um, National Remote Sensing Department, who had created a land cover map. So we went, I went there and we did a validation. So we basically looked at the map using high resolution imagery to, to um, see how accurate it was. And we found a few areas that needed some improvement and then they went back and, and fixed those areas. And so here's um, what, what they've produced. So they, in order to do the, the land use change, you need two dates. So they used 2002 as their baseline and then 2012 as the change. And what I want to point out um, on this, if you can kind of, if you can see it, is if you look at this, look at this map here. You see, there's a lot of orange. And this, look at this one. There's not as much orange, right? And orange is shrubland or scrubland or grassland. So it's shrubs. It can, it can, or grassland. They don't have a lot of grassland there. So it's mostly sort of scrubby areas. Or it could also be forests that are uh, have been cut and are just starting to come back, right? Because actually now if you look at look at this uh, map, what I've basically done is shown what those areas that were grassland, scrubland, were, how they were mapped out in 2012. In 2012, they were mapped as forest. So here we see that that's actually afforestation. So they're, they're actually increasing their forest cover. And this is very unusual for developing countries. You know, I've worked a lot of developing countries doing forest cover mapping, and usually it's the other way around. You know, you're, you're looking at the deforestation rates. Um, but again, uh, you know, Vietnam, I think, had a, a mandate to increase their forest cover. And they have a mandate now to maintain this amount of forest cover. So they're really, really um, proactive about that. And what this does is because forests are carbon sink, right? So instead of emitting carbon, they're actually capturing carbon here. And this is helping to offset some of their other emissions because Vietnam is also growing, so their emissions from energy production, from transportation are all going up. But at least from land use, they're going, they're actually going the other way. And um, once that data is produced, it can then be used um, in the greenhouse gas inventory process. So that's, this is the more specific uh, process to document where all the emissions are occurring. And there, uh, there's a product called Alu, Agricultural and Land Use uh, National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Software. It was developed by this man here, Stephen Obel from Colorado State, with um, support from the EPA. And so that's what countries can use to 
to refine their emissions estimates, to document it all, and to have it in a, um, a format that, that can be preserved, too. Um, so I worked with him and this team um, back in May, and then he, he just went out there again as a follow-up recently. So, so they're, they're basically now finished with the land use portion of their, their reporting, and it's going to go into a document like this. This is from 2014. And this is called a biennial update report. So this is the this document is full of charts and graphs and figures, basically tables of, of numbers, all the all the emissions data from all these different sectors. And so the land use part is just one sector from it's this put in this report. So that work that we've been doing now with Vietnam is going to go into their next report, which will be in 2016. So that's it's kind of cool to see that you know full cycle coming all the way around, creating the data, using the data, not putting in the report. So I, I can't leave without, you know, just giving a plug for um, for volunteering, for ITAP. I asked how many people had volunteered. If you get the opportunity, I really strongly suggest you consider it. Um, it's it's just a wonderful opportunity. You learn so much about yourself. You, you learn about other people, other cultures. And it's not just like traveling, you know. You're not a tourist. You're actually working with these people and, um, you know, being part of their lives as well, and so that's it's a much more um, um, fulfilling experience, I think, that way. So, with that said, I think I'll um, end my presentation. I, I think Barb said we'll, we'll hold questions till the end, and, and then um, let Jean go here. Thank you, Justin. Excellent presentation. Um, and you can see that he's the technical lead. I'm not going to go into those technical details. Um, I'm Jean Parcher, and I'm the project manager for the Land Cover for Climate. And I'm actually a USGS employee that um, has been on a long-term detail here with with Barb's group of um, ITAP. And it's been a it's been a wonderful experience. So first, I'm going to actually I'm going to talk about Africa. First, what is Africa? It's not Ebola, okay? <laughs> um, and this pin I actually got from um, a Brussels Airlines um, flight attendant, and they all wear them because they fly a lot from Brussels down to all parts of Africa. So it's not Ebola. Also, a lot of people don't realize that Africa is so large, the landmass, that you can fit the United States, China, India, parts of Europe, all of Europe, actually, or Western, Eastern, and Iberia, Mexico and Japan all into the landmass of Africa. So when people say, oh my gosh, you're going to Africa, are you going to get Ebola? I'm like, do you realize how big the continent is? Okay, I'm not going to the three Ebola countries where Ebola was. was. Um, it's actually 54 countries. The newest one is South Sudan. Um, and it's got um, a lot of variation in the landscape. You know, the Sahara Desert is the largest warm desert in the world. Antarctica and Arctic are larger, but they're not warm. Um, it's got um, the second largest sink of carbon in the, uh, Congo, rain the Congo rainforest right here. Um, it's got a lot of um, savanna grasslands through the transition zone, the steppe forest and the rift valley here. We have all the wildlife um, migration, um, and all the way down the southern tip of South Africa, it's got evergreen forests down here. Um, so it is ex extremely varied continent um, in terms of the landscape. Um, just to give you a couple pictures, um, so here's Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, or Tanzania, I think Tanzania is the way to say it. Um, Lake Victoria, I'm going to talk a little more about that in Uganda. We just came back from there, and um, that's the second largest uh, freshwater lake in the world. So does anybody know which is the first largest? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and then here's like here's the Rift Valley going through Kenya and some more landscape in Kenya. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of our work in East Africa and some about our work in West Africa. Um, and West Africa, near the coast, you've got a lot of lush vegetation. Here's in the Ivory Coast, or Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana. 
But as you go inland, Burkina Faso, um, you don't have the, the precipitation. You have more scrub in savanna. And Senegal is mixed, but it's, it's much drier than when you go farther south in Ghana and Ivory Coast. Um, and, and we did actually three different trainings in, in West Africa. Um, just a little bit, um, just to show, you know, there's, I don't know how many cultures and languages are all over Africa. I don't know if Kosivi knows that, but I'm not going to put them on the spot. Um, but this is just the Maasai, and you can see these are the ones in Kenya. There's a picture of ones in Tanzania. Um, they're the same tribe, but they're separated by these borders that were made by the Europeans, okay, and, and um, when, during the colonial time. Um, I just want to say a few words about Togo because um, Kosivia Megan, who assists in the Lancaster for Climate Project and assists in ITAP, um, he's originally from Togo, so I asked him to put this together. Togo is in West Africa. It's one of the smallest countries in Africa. Um, it, um, but over 37 languages are spoken in that small area, okay? Um, only two presidents. Um, the current one has been serving since 2005, but his father served for 38 years. So, probably not a democracy, okay? Um, but most of the, you know, the, um, the economic um, base is, is on agriculture and some phosphate. So, it is really based on, um, on you know, agriculture and, and, and land and mining. Um, but even with, you know, such a small country with, um, you know, um, it has a lot of diversity. And here's just um, some pictures of, you know, these are the um, the Iwo people, which is Iwo, which is from Kosivi's um, area, um, and the Lama people celebrating. And in the rural areas, they've got some very interesting looking dwellings. But then they, you know, they have cities, so it's, it's, it's diverse. Um, so just to give you a couple facts on Africa, um, the population growth rate in 2013 was 4.8 percent, and it's got 16 percent of the world's population. It has been projected that in 2050, the, um, after every, for every child born, one out of three will have been, will be born in Africa. So it's got a huge population growth going there. Um, and most of the population depends on rain-fed crops and pastoralism. So the, Justin talked about, um, you know, the carbon cycle and greenhouse gas and how fossil fuels is a large emission. In Africa, it's a little different. First, they've got one of the largest sinks of carbon in the um, Congo forest there, um, and they have very low fossil fuel emissions, okay? Um, but land use change and deforestation is accounts for like 35% of the total emissions in Africa. So mapping what those changes are is critical to get an idea of, of what's happening and how much um, um, carbon emissions is ongoing. Um, and interesting, the amount of emissions from fossil fuels in Africa versus the amount from land use change are nearly the same. Now, if you were going to take the United States or even North America, fossil fuel emissions would be extremely high and land use or agriculture would be down here. But in Africa, they're balanced. Neither one is, I mean, I'm not going to say they're, I'm not an expert, Tom, is of how high these are, but um, with a huge population growing, um, you know, you're going to see a lot of, um, uh, you could say a big increase with that. So that was uh, that's the reason why the countries in Africa really want to participate in, in doing this mapping, and it's critical for us to have um, have this information. Well, I'm just gonna I want to give Justin talked about land use and land cover mapping. Okay, um, I just want to show you it's it's not something that you just take a satellite image and then you just press a button and you come up with an answer. Okay. Um, this is a case that we did a little short case study. We sent an ITAP um, volunteer over to Malawi for a few weeks, and he worked with um, some some people from Kenya who knew the area very well, and Mal and people from Malawi in the Forest Service. So here we've got a Landsat image of this area. The, then we're showing where the forest 
in the same area has been mapped four different ways. The green is the forest, the blue is the, the lake and the river. So you can see here, based on what either the application or the way they wanted to map it, they're saying this whole area is forest. But if you look in more detail with the satellite image, you can actually pick out areas that are forest and areas that are not forest. Now, why they did it this way versus this way, we don't know. That's what the study was to look at why that was happening. Um, but this is a more accurate representation. And here's one that the USGS did that also shows more accurate representation. So it is very subjective to do your mapping. Um, it's not clear cut, but the, if you want to be reporting statistics, you, we need to have a way to validate how accurate that is um, so that we, you know, we can compare a country's reports. And just um, you know, to show you like on the landscape how difficult this can be because um, there is so much um, mixed usage on the landscape. This, this photo, these are all actually from Kenya. You can see where the forest is. And so in a, in a satellite image, you probably could pick that out fairly well. Here, you can't tell whether it's agriculture. You've got some settlement. Um, you've got some maybe pasture. Um, but that's, that's a little clearer than looking over here. This is very mixed. How do you map that? So you have to make decisions on you know, what is entitled a forest? What is entitled a, what, what, what do you, what is the definition of a savanna area and so forth? Um, and then when you get to agriculture, this is actually a tea plantation, okay? So you don't call that just savanna or forest, it's agriculture actually. And here's one that, um, in similar area that they're actually cutting down the forest, so. Um, it's not clear cut. That's why I, um, we spend so much time working on these projects. Um, we just returned from a workshop that we did in Uganda, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I'll talk some about West Africa. Um, in Uganda, we, we did a workshop with five countries on Lake Victoria which um, includes um, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and within the watershed, Rwanda and Burundi. Um, lake Victoria is the second largest freshwater lake. Um, and all of, you know, this is the watershed boundary. So um, it's a very important source of agriculture here, important source of water and, and mining. Um, but you've got all these countries sharing it, and you've got to protect the environment. Um, so in this workshop, we had representatives, or we had participants with background in GIS, background in remote sensing, but also water quality specialists. So we were trying to get a good idea from the water quality specialist of what were actually the threats in the, and to the environment. What would they want to be mapping out of the land use and land cover changes so that they could be monitoring, um, you know, I want monitoring what's happening in the five different countries, help work with the countries to put forth different types of environmental, maybe regulation, um, and, and you know, um, looking at how it is affecting the water quality. So um, we did this with a couple USAID groups. One group is through USAID and NASA, and they're called the SERVIR group. And their hub is in Nairobi, and it's called the Regional Center for Mapping for Resources for Development, or RCMRD. Um, and you know the issues that were coming up in this in this region is high population growth or increase in population, conversion of land, um, mainly you know from their natural environment, wetlands, forest, or grasslands, to either farming or urban or mining. And then how that is affecting um, the water quality issues. Hyacinth is a, is a major um, problem in the lake. So we provided them with a full Landsat mosaic of the, um, of the, actually all the countries. And this is a mosaic where we have already done processing to the imagery and um, made it cloud free. Um, found the best images, made so you don't see seams between the different Landsat pieces. Um, and so 
that is a lot of work that the USGS does, um, and they can do it with their supercomputers, but you can't do it with just a couple PCs. So we provided that to the countries, and then we provided them um, with um, this land cover data of you know, using a full remote sensing process. And this is Landsat 30 meter. So it is basically a regional data set that is, um, that is, is similar in, in the process, the dates and everything for the entire region. So it's not country by country. So it's, it's much easier to compare and to look at what's happening on the landscape. And out of this workshop, um, we produced a statement and in the statement, and then we got the input from the participants, some of the key things were, one, they want to encourage sharing of data. So not only this data, but data of meteorolo meteorological data so they can see the climate changes, water quality data, um, mapping data, and say all five countries need to share that. You can't just keep it to yourself. Um, the other thing is that they want to have better access to satellite imagery, they want better inter internet infrastructure, and they actually had some political representation um, from the East Africa Commission, and they took note of that. The other, the last thing was that they want to develop, they have developed a lot of vulnerability assessment tools using GIS, and they want that process along with the remote sensing process to be developed into a package that can be used in other parts of Africa for analyzing um, how changes to the landscape are affecting water quality. So, and, and water is a, a major issue in, in East Africa. So that statement, um, actually when we get final approval, will we'll come out. Um, so I'm just going to now end with a couple slides about West Africa and a, a actually um, a partnership that we've developed with the Food and Agriculture Organization on using a specific type, type of software. So we worked in seven countries, or with seven countries. We had three workshops. And those countries include um, Benin, Togo, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, and Senegal, and then Cape Verde. Um, so we did a series of three workshops. Um, so we had some that were francophone um, speaking workshops where we hired translators because um, unfortunately the, the trainers don't know fluent French. Um, we would like to get, you know, have people know, have everything, but you can't always get that. Um, and so we had one, we had three countries in Senegal, three in Ivory Coast, and then English in Ghana. And this software is called Collect Earth, and it's actually based on um, using high resolution, or actually just imagery in the cloud. So it's all internet based. So what that allows is instead of having um, specialists in remote sensing working um, to analyze the landscape, it allows landscape ecologists to do the interpretation. So they know their landscape. And it's also a spatially sampling process to look at land use change. So it's not a wall-to-wall -wall map like we sh I showed you for Uganda or for the Lake Victoria region. It's a sampling. Um, and all the tools, it's all free and open. It's under the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, it uses um, uh, cloud-based systems, uh, Google Earth. I'm sure many of you guys have used Google Earth. Uh, Microsoft Bing Maps and Nokia here and each of these companies are fighting to get the most high resolution imagery into their cloud system so it's all free and they, let them fight it out not us you know um, and it's fully customizable they actually we uh, FAO has developed it in multiple languages we're going to train in Vietnam and we're um, paying to get the manuals translated into Vietnamese and then we just share that with anybody else doing training there so we don't have to do it over and over again. And Justin talked about this ALU tool, the agriculture and land use tool, it outputs to that. So I'm going to have you all do a little test here, okay? So this is the menu and the software. So. It comes up, you've got a sampling box. Look at this whole box here. It's, I think, about 100 meter by 100 meter. You're on top of a high resolution satellite image, OK? Um, so you have to say, what is in this box? How would you define that? And 
you know, you can see a lot more detail from the eye. So, um, and, and I know we've got too much light coming up here, but, you know, would you call that a forest? No. Would you call it a grassland? I would. Would you call it cropland? Probably not. There's no settlement in there. So you define, the, the operator defines, they know their landscape. So they're going to say grassland, for example. But we've had people sit there and argue in front of, you know, we say, like, what would you call that? And they're all from the same country. And they have to come up with, with what they decide that looks like. So then you can use this little bar here, this little clock, bring it down or click on it. And it will then slide over and um, you can look at earlier images. So you can go back 10 years. And then you can look at what that looked like 10 years ago. So let's say 10 years ago, it was a forest. So then you got to go down here and say that was a forest, and now it's been converted to a grassland. So you, you, or it was, now it's a grassland, it used to be a forest. So you click on that. And then there's more questions in the menu that come up of like how many trees are there, or, you know. Um, so you, that's all customizable. So. I'm just going to have you work, walk through this for um, an area in Ghana. So this is Lake Bosomtwi in Ghana, which actually was created by a meteorite or an asteroid over a million years ago. An asteroid, actually. It's about 720 meters deep, 8 kilometers across, and it's in the Ashanti region of Ghana. So it's um, for the Ashanti people, it's a sacred place. Um, we actually got to go visit there. Um, so I'm just going to take you to, um, you know, a settlement that's near there. Um, here's the digital globe, high resolution, probably a five meter image from 2003. And you can see the settlements. You can see what looks like forest or maybe shrub. Um, an open field here. I don't know. Maybe that's their soccer or football field. Who knows? Then in here you start to see kind of rows of things. Is that agriculture? What's happening there? Um, here's some more shrubs. So let's move forward. And here's 10 years later, 2013. Same area. A little different image. It's a spot image, so maybe a little different resolution. But you're still looking at the same area. And so now look at this. You've got rows of items here. Now you've got a lot more over here. Um, to me, that looks like that's definitely planted by man. Man, okay. Um, does anybody have an idea of what that might be? What this vegetation might be? Oil. Yes, very good. Palm oil, excellent. Um, so palm oil, they're tall trees um, with a fruit on them that is used. That oil palm is used in quite a few different um, products and food. So the question is. Are we going to call this forest or are we going to call this agriculture? Okay. And uh, we go back. So, you know, was this earlier in this region? Would you call that shrub? And now it's switched to ag or forest. You know, these are the kind of decisions that the country needs to decide how they're going to report their information. It's critical. Um, but you can see how complex it is. It's not easy at all. Um, but it's critical so that we can measure how much um, carbon is being emitted um, and how much is a sink. So, um, so here's just um, some pictures of our training in Senegal. Um, we had three countries there. We actually had very crowded conditions. Um, but people were very enthused to learn. It's all Collect Earth works off of the internet. So we had the people work in groups because we didn't always have fast enough internet speed. Um, so we, we had to push for working in groups. Um, and so that actually helped them to make decisions together. But they were very enthused um, getting her certificate. And I have to say, I just love the dress. This was Friday. And we, they took a break to go to the mosque for a few hours. So we, we had a long lunch break that day, but just really loved their dress. So my final words is that, you know, climate change affects all of us. And my first trip to Africa was to Namibia. And after we did, it was a UNFCCC workshop, um, Framework for Climate Change workshop for South and East Africa. Um, the five of us, I'm not in the picture, I took it. We're sitting on a sand dune. So we've got a woman from St. Lucia, Caribbean. We've got American, a German, and she was actually brought up or raised in East Germany before 
you know, became all united, and Namibia. And we all sat there and talked about how, what we want to see for our children and grandchildren in the future and how it's so important to preserve our planet and have a sustainable lifestyle for all of us. And I just couldn't believe it. Here we have people from four different continents and we're all talking about um, how important this is. Um, so, you know, even though Africa may not emit a large part of fossil fuels, the importance of mapping of what they do is, is critical. And for we do it in the U.S. too, our mapping and so forth. But we, we need to um, continue knowing what, what is having a handle on what the changes are in, in our world. And lastly, um, this is kind of a collage of some of the trainers and our FAO. Um, partners, so Justin, Beverly's another trainer, Barb, um, Olivia's helped out here. These are some people from Rome, the FAO team for developing the software, and this is Joe Ting Wu, who's another trainer from USGS, and Kosivi, and our UNFCCC representative, Sabin Gwendahu, and some of our FAO um, colleagues. So, um, and actually we have a colleague here from Cote d'Ivoire, Abidjan, um, Angie, and she's wearing a Collect Earth t-shirt. So, with that I will end and thank you very much.